Uh, as he says, the title of this talk is the history of the technical achievements of the Union Oil Company of California. Let me say a couple of words before I start. I will probably use the words Union Oil, UNOCAL, and we interchangeably, but it's all the same entity. Uh, secondly, the ACS seemed to want historical paper rather than technical, but at the end, if you have technical questions, I will answer them. Thirdly, when I started the paper, I realized there were a lot of scientists and engineers who were involved in all this history, and if I named them all, it would take a lot of time. And secondly, I'd be sure to leave somebody out. So I decided not to do that except for one gentleman, Mr. Fred L. Hartley, who was so instrumental in uh, the history of Unicap. So with that, I'll start the first slide, and I don't panic. I'm not going through this. I just wanted to point out, uh, I guess this is set this way. The company was formed in 1890, and in keeping with the, the theme of this, they started a research lab in Santa Paula, California in 1891. They realized they had a wonderful potential product, but they had to do a lot of work in order to make it into saleable products. So uh, they formed a little lab, I think it cost $2,500, and I'll talk a little more in a minute. Coming on down uh, here in 1901, Union Oil moved its headquarters to Los Angeles. That was an important step. Coming down to 1922, I should have marked these, uh, New Petroleum Research Lab that started the LA refinery. That was a real step upward. And then in 1951, Research Lab at Brea, Orange County, California. And uh, I see people in the room who have worked there. Uh, I mentioned Mr. Fred L. Hartley, 1964 he became president and chief executive officer. He had worked at the refinery in a high capacity and was transferred to the research department and actually became director of research, which was fortunate for us because that made him realize the importance of research. He came through the chain. Uh, then I'll come down here to uh, 1983, that's where the name Unical came from. When a, a raider came after us, and we had to incorporate and start fighting. 1990, we had 100 years. Recapitulating the laps here just a moment. 1891, uh, Santa Paula, we just had a counter, glass bottles, test tubes, a burner, and a microscope, the minimum for studying this strange material. 1922, we had small pilot plants, heavy on analytical test development because the standard tests were not in the text at that time. In 1951, the Brea, California uh, complex started, a wonderful place. They could duplicate any working problem in the field. This Friday at Brea, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary of the opening of that uh, facility. Ultimately, there were a thousand people there we named it Science and Technology, and then finally, as a vote to Mr. Hartley, we called it the Hartley Research Center. That pleased him. We told him we voted on it. He wanted to see the tally. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of that uh, research facility taken uh, many years ago. Uh, when it was built, it was out in the boonies, so to speak, and there was a rotating neon light around that 76. And at night, when the pilots came, in, the commercial pilots came in from San Francisco and Denver to Orange County Airport, that was a beacon. And as the houses built up, they complained about the flickering in their bedrooms at night, so it was shut off. Immediately, the commercial pilots complained. They had other means of navigation, of course, but it's nice to have a, a beacon that you can rely on. <laughs> uh, a Union Oil Company of California was what we call an integrated oil company. We did all four of the functions, exploration, go out there and find it, production, pipeline, refining, and marketing. Uh, on chemicals, we had agricultural, that included fertilizers and crop protection, polymers, hot melts, lots of solvents. In the minerals, we were into molybdenum, niobium in Brazil, lanthanides in California, and for a while, uranium and coal. Many of the petroleum companies got into uh, these uh, other minerals, and I don't think anybody really succeeded. It was not our knitting. Here's Mr. Hartley. Uh, 
uh, he's known as Mr. Union Oil, and there's the uh, building in downtown Los Angeles that was built in 1958 <clears throat> and dominated the skyline for years because it was on a hill, the only hill in Los Angeles, and there were no so-called skyscrapers. Later it was dwarfed by huge uh, other buildings, and it lasted for about 30 years. Uh, this doesn't show up too well, but I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the petroleum industry. Uh, down here is Standard Oil Trust that uh, was talked about earlier, and it was broken up into these, and, it, and gradually the blue lines came together, and they're still coming together, as you know. Who would have thought that Exxon and Mobil could come together 20 years ago? Wouldn't happen. They're Texaco and uh, Chevron. Uh, but way up the top is Union Oil, one of the first. Not many blue lines at that time. In 1965, Pure Oil merged into that. And it, I only took this to uh, 1990. If I took it on out, it would there'd be far fewer blue lines. Now, in the uh, 70s, uh, as you remember, we had embargoes, prediction of shortages, and there were shortages. And there were lines at the pumps, so the public started screaming about uh, monopoly. So. Unical put this this together and ran it in various places. What a way to run a monopoly. Here are 70 different companies, the largest one which has 9% of the nation's total oil and gas properties. Lots of bills were introduced to divest the uh, petroleum companies and tariffs both vertically and horizontally. But after extensive investigations, no antitrust violations were found and no bills were passed. The public is still suspicious of us, but uh, in fact, it happened again this year, as you know. Uh, since Union Oil was a technical company, I just went and looked up some of the patents. 1985, they filed 105 patent applications. We had a great group of patent lawyers. 60 patents were ultimately granted. As you know, it takes a year to five years to get them. Uh, and these areas of refining catalyst processes, technology, shale, herbicides, lubricants, carbon, solar, animal feed. In 1989, again, we kept the record of 108, 575 granted. So for a little company, it was indeed a technical company. I remember one year, Union Oil had sales of $12 billion. Exxon had profit of $12 billion. So that tells you what small potatoes we were. When I first started in uh, with a petroleum company, I thought, what's the simplest representation I can have of what happens in the refinery. You come in with the crude oil, you distill it. You get low boiling fractions, high boiling fractions. With the high boiling, you've got to decrease the molecular weight. With the, with the low boiling, you have to increase it and then the, improve the properties. The hydro treating, reforming, isomerization, so forth. <coughs> well, Union Oil concentrated on hydrocracking and hydro treating. We were into reforming a little bit, isomerization, uh, but nothing serious. No company could do it all, so they tended to concentrate. Exxon came the closest. They were into everything because they had the, the desire and the money. So Union was heavy into refining catalyst technology. In the early 40s, our people, Unical, Union Oil people, were into uh, low surface area metal oxides, of course, it didn't last long. <coughs> but later, we got into high surface area aluminous, silica aluminous, impregnated with molybdenum, nickel, cobalt, and so forth. Those became more or less standard in the industry, and many companies were working on them, including the catalyst companies and the universities did some fine work on hallucination and mechanisms and so on. Uh, uh, I think I'll cover this right now. Union Oil actually licensed around 500 hydro-treating units around the world. I think it's considerably higher than that now. And in hydrocracking, we were the first to use YZ lights and noble metals as catalysts. People predicted that those strongly acidic uh, sites on the YZ lights would simply absorb the nitrogen and be neutralized. But in fact, it handled it very nicely. They had very long lives. Uh, in 1989, Unical hydrocrackers accounted for 60% of the world's licensed capacity more than 130 units. I don't know what it is now, but uh, that's a great success for a little small potatoes company. In the 1980s, 
unit gal, unit all. I introduced 15 entirely new hydro processing catalysts, which shows you the effort that we're putting on it. To digress just a little, the funny Union Oil kind of had a sense of humor. And out in the, some of the pumping units, we would make them look like grasshoppers just to attract people. And here was one of our more successful things. The, every year down at the Los Angeles refinery, would paint a, uh, one of the big tanks as a jack-o'-lantern and have the kids come in their costumes and give them popcorn and candy and play games and so forth. And that was a great publicity event. I realized I couldn't cover everything that Unical did, so I just picked out some things. Here was the use of a monopod up in uh, Alaskan Inlet. As you know, it, the conditions up there with the fast tides and the ice uh, makes it uh, very dangerous. So with the monopod, you present the minimum surface and it lasts a lot longer. And with this one, they could drill 32 wells from the center. This was a good application of uh, that technology. Now, Unical was into geothermal, one of the companies that came with the pure oil. And uh, in 1975, President Ford came and toured the Northern California, we called it the geysers. And he, we got along well with him. He and Mr. Hartley, they were teased that they looked like receding hairlines, both the same face. But he quickly grasped the importance of geothermal. And Unical went on to uh, develop the salt and sea in Southern California and was big in the Philippines and on other, in other Asian areas. Here was an interesting uh, development. As you know, so crude oil comes in with lots of sulfur in it in general, and it ends up as H2S hydrogen sulfide. Later, it's reduced to sulfur, and it usually is powdered sulfur, and it presents a problem of dust pollution, even explosions have been, been caused by it. So one of our scientists at Brea developed a technique for forcing the liquid sulfur through a gun with water, and the result was popcorn-shaped sulfur pellets, easy to handle, no dust at all, not flammable, and they had a very broad surface area for reaction with soil. The sulfur is good for not only acidifying the soil, but it's a, a essential element in all growing things. My color didn't turn out too well here, but here's a huge pile of uh, popcorn sulfur would make it all day long like that and the trucks would come in and take it out into the farm. Now ACS asked uh, me to specifically talk about uh, shale development because Union, Union Oil was the first into it, one of the first. We stayed in it the longest, spent the most money, got hurt the worst, but nevertheless it's history. In the 1920s they began acquiring properties in Garfield County, Colorado, uh, estimated that uh, up to six billion barrels was recoverable if we had the technology. Uh, in the 40s, they did some work. In 55, we started to plant at Parachute, Colorado, on a day. It was successful, but it was shut down after proving. Then in the 70s, as you know, the, the things, as I mentioned, the, there were predictions of oil shortages, and the Arabian countries were getting angry at us, and eventually there were the two embargoes. So Unical started building a plant where they did a lot of retort bee work and then were authorized to build a 10,000 barrel per day uh, plant at Parachute. It was a big deal. At, at one time, 1,700 people were working there. The plant started up, or our construction was completed. It took about a year to start it up. Uh, and it was successful technically, but in the meantime, the price of uh, Petroleum was coming down and we realized that uh, it was not going to be viable economically. But we worked on a few years and finally shipped Syncru to Chicago. I'll mention what that is in a moment. But I mentioned Mr. Hartley. When he came in as head of the company, he felt he'd been given a legacy of reserves of petroleum. And uh, that would be his, well, that would be used up during his tenure. And he wanted to leave a legacy for whoever came after him, and he was sure it would be oil shale. Well, he went through his grave not realizing that, but on the other hand, it may come true yet. Uh, I'll just show this to show that the uh, plant, the upgrading plant, was right against the mountain. 
this was a five acre plot carved out up the side of the hill so that the shale comes out of the mountain right into the plant. And, uh, let me show the retail here. We call this the uni shale B retort. We love that word uni, you know, unifying, uniforming, and so forth. Anyway, the raw shale comes in. It's been crushed to about 1.5 inches maximum. And there's a rock pump here, which sounds strange, but it's reciprocating with sliding plates. It pumps the rock upward. Hot retort gas comes in the top. And when it reaches about 1,000 degrees, the kerogen is released. And uh, you have uh, what we call shale oil. Then, the rock, of course, the rock goes on up for the angle of repose, spills it, and it's uh, handled. And down at the bottom there, you can see it's, uh, it can be taken out, and actually you can put plants on it and grow grass and so forth. Uh, anyway, uh, crude shale oil comes out here. Uh, I guess there's nothing else particularly there, but I'll show the properties here of the sh that shale oil as it comes out. Gravity, gravity of 22, uh, boils anywhere from 150 to 1100. It's got high sulfur, high nitrogen, high oxygen. And here's a, here's a mean one here, arsenic at 50 parts. After it goes through the, we had a hydro treater right on site, high pressure. Here's the raw shale oil. This is what we call synthetic crude oil. By the time it goes through there, you see the nitrogen, the sulfur, and oxygen are acceptable, and the arsenic's essentially down to nothing. And it compares very well with light Arabian, Mervin, and crude. And this syncrude was what we shipped to uh, Chicago refinery of Unocal, and they made uh, very good fuels out of it. This demonstration produced three million barrels of uh, shale oil. So technically, we have to say it was successful. Some days maybe it can be economically successful. I wanted to mention <laughs> that uh, back in the 70s, well, it's actually in the eight, early 80s, the, the Raiders were after the little oil companies, petroleum companies. It was a legitimate legal thing to go after companies. And Mr. Boone Pickens here from Mesa Petroleum went after Gulf, and as you know, he destroyed it. He tried to destroy Phillips, and he essentially destroyed Unical in the sense that it never recovered. They won, but uh, it was mortally wounded by a huge debt. And it mortally wounded Mr. Hartley, too. He never really recovered after that. But uh, that was a very unpleasant time in the industry. Uh, one of the last things I'll cover here is um, was controversial. When uh, the federal government and California and other states were looking to get a, a uh, well, they were really dictating the pollutants out the tailpipe of uh, motor vehicles. And uh, the famous uh, auto oil program was started where 14 petroleum companies, three automotive companies got together, had a program to look for uh, the uh, composition that would give minimum pollutants, CO, burnt, unburnt hydrocarbons, and nitrogen oxides. Well, Unical uh, joined that program, and it was a democracy, so even though we didn't agree with what they were doing, we went along with it and supported it. Um, but at the same time, they started their own program, a broader program, that was permitted under the rules, and uh, indeed they found a non-obvious gasoline formulation that burned cleaner and uh, was so different that the, there was a patent issue, and I think it was 94 or 95, and immediately six major refiners sued Unical, challenging the validity of the patent. Uh, the patent was upheld in the district court, the circuit court, and by the Supreme Court. And Unical uh, offered to license this technology at a modest fee, meaning like one or two cents a gallon, as opposed to five or six, which the court said they could choose. And just to show you how the tabloids work, this summer, when the price of fuel went up, they blamed it on Unical because of these uh, fees. There was nothing to that, but uh, you know, use whatever ammunition you got. Uh, I just put this up. Most of you know about gasoline, and, and it's a complicated mixture of uh, hydrocarbons, various additives, which I won't go into. But here was the uh, 
Unical research parameters, there was the auto oil study. We included many more things, and indeed, uh, we came to, a, I think, a better conclusion than they did. There were five patents issued on these reformulated gasolines, and uh, here's a list of them if anybody wanted them. It's uh, fairly technical, and, and it's actually very legal now because just last week a major company sued Unical again uh, for acting improperly, which has been brought up before the courts before and uh, properly mitigated. So it's now lawyer to lawyer and not scientist to scientist. So with that, I think I've used up my time and I will stop unless you have some questions. Thank you.